the Okanagan people are a large and growing population living on confined reserves. Through a series of illegal past actions, these reserves have diminished to the extent that they cannot sustain our community. The Commonage Reserve, known to us as Indian Reserve Number 9, is one such reserve. It was removed in 1889. Indian Reserve Number 9 is almost 28,000 acres from Vernon in the north, across all the land between Okanagan Lake, Kalmalka Lake, and Wood Lake and as far down as Okanagan Center in the south. It's been over 30 years since we filed this specific claim with the federal government. With the efforts of many chiefs, we are still at the starting point of these negotiations. We believe the land claim is important to us, not only to all residents of, in the North Okanagan, but also those of Canada and residents of British Columbia, since it was through their illegal actions the honor of the Crown is at stake here. After 130 years of injustice, we are telling our history. Our ties to this land are deep. Our knowledge keepers remind the rest of us that we were here from the beginning. It is estimated that 500 years ago, there were over 1 million Okanagans. The Creator brought us into this land and we are bound to it. This bond spans over 10,000 years. Back to times when this land was a very different place. We have always loved this land, knowing that it has sustained us since time immemorial. We have always honored the gifts from the lands and the waters. Our past leaders were wise when they defended this land. We were and are the gatekeepers of our Northern Territory on behalf of all Okanagan Nation people. Before we were herded onto reserves, our economy was dynamic. Red Fox, who was like our trade minister, kept our relations good with the neighboring tribes. Our traditional territories are vast compared to today's reserves. We were a progressive people, and Kuala, our chief, had 500 head of horses before the settlers arrived. Okanagan people were practicing agriculture as early as 1841. This only made sense since our predecessors had adopted wise forms of cultivation through controlled burns and other methods, ensuring good harvests of food and medicines from the forests and grasslands. As strong, proud, and resourceful as we were, we could not stop the growing tide of settlement, nor could we ignore the massive transformation of values and laws that these newcomers brought with them. The creation of a reserve started in the colonial period when Nkwala was our chief. In the Okanagan, a large 10-square-mile reserve with the northeast corner at Swan Lake was set apart for the Okanagan people. Unfortunately, prior to Confederation, the reserve started to be cut back, and Nkwala, through his diplomacy, subsided his people's frustrations. Soon after Confederation, Anchilhitsa became one of our chiefs. 
the allotment of Indian reserves became a contentious issue between the provincial and federal governments. How should reserves be set up? How big should they be? And what kind of land should be included? To resolve these issues, the federal and provincial government established the Joint Indian Reserve Commission, made up of representatives from each government and a mutually appointed representative, Gilbert Sprott. The commission's mandate was to fix and determine areas of land to be set aside as Indian reserves. By the time he arrived in the Okanagan in 1877, Commissioner Sprott identified ranchers like the Vernons, O'Keefe's, and Ellison's as occupying much of the good land. There had been talk amongst the chiefs in taking up arms against the settlers. After two months and several meetings with the Okanagan people, the commissioner identified all nine of the Okanagan reserves, including IR-9, the Commonage Reserve. I was born in Vernon, raised out here for 68 years, schooled out here. My grandfather's name was uh, Pierre Lewis. I was a chief for 27 years out here, and we rode the range together in the early 50s, watching the fence line and cattle and such, and uh, he used to point out things to me from up there, what it was like, eh? And we'd stop in the shade, and he'd tell me some stories about how they used to hunt cougars down at, um, in their base camp was out down there at Oyama. They were both sides of the mountains on the Comnage side, and the others, they'd chase cougars around in the winter time and hunt there and spend camp there in the winter camps there, eh? Pasture lands were now under heavy demand. The Joint Reserve Commission decided to set apart a shared right of pasturage that would be enjoyed by both the Indians and local white settlers. The Commission, however, had doubts about its own authority to set apart that kind of unique interest in land, and so, in its minute of decision, it said, if we don't have the authority to set apart a joint pasturage, this land will remain full reserve status. The boundaries of the Commonage Reserve were then defined in the minute of decision documented as reaching from the narrowest part of the lands between Okanagan Lake and Long Lake, today called Kalmelka, to the northern boundary adjacent to any lands that were occupied by white settlers at Priest Valley, present-day part of Vernon, and the head of Long Lake as determined on investigation by the Commission. Sprott confirmed this boundary in 1878 after investigating the extent of white settlements. Then in 1881, Mr. E. Mohan surveyed the Commonage Reserve. Instead of conducting the survey in accordance with the minute of decision, Mohan excluded over 2,500 acres in the north. But why had a slice of the Commonage Reserve that was set apart for the Okanagan Band under the minute of decision been cut off by Mohan's survey without any explanation? One possible explanation is that Forbes Vernon, a local rancher employed by the province as Chief Commissioner of Lands and Works, had purchased land in the northern part of the Comanage Reserve, and so there may well have been a connection between this land interest and the decision by the surveyor to cut off a piece of the northern Comanage Reserve. In the years that followed, the sharing of the Comanage became unworkable. Settlers felt the commission had been too generous to the Okanagan people, and the locals complained that the Indians were trespassing. Meanwhile, the federal government had doubts that the Joint Reserve Commission actually had the authority to set apart a pasturage in common, and, as stated in the minute of decision, if they did not have this authority, then the commonage would be a full Indian reserve. With more and more pressure from local settlers and non-native cattle farmers, the province began lobbying for the commonage to be cut off. This land was far too valuable to be set apart as an Indian reserve. Instead of protecting the Okanagan Band's right to the Comnage Reserve, the federal government simply relinquished the Band's interest in this reserve without the Band's knowledge and without the Band's consent. Oh, my, my, my parents used to, we used to come through here and then they would tell us all about all of the reserves here and all the, uh, we picked the, the uh, berries because uh, that's what they used to do when they were growing up. And then uh, those days there was no homes around here. There was just a, a, a buggy road. Yeah. Yeah. Just, uh, just the Indians out here. Yeah. 
with their horses and and uh, I know where they used to bring horses that would hear him. When they opened it up for settlers to move in there, then uh, pretty soon like people like Peter Jack and ever raised these animals there and stuff, they, and others used to use that. So the, the natives got crowded out of there. Some of my mother's people used to stay up in the commons, but they were run out of there at one time. The decision to cut off the Common Age Reserve appeared as sudden as a federal order in council, but in actual fact, it has an interesting background involving different levels of government. Led by Commissioner Peter O'Reilly, who replaced Gilbert Sprott in 1880, a plan to trade the Common Age Reserve was discussed and accepted federally by Sir John A. MacDonald and provincially by Premier Smythe in 1886. At about the same time, Forbes Vernon, unaware of what was coming down, strongly objected to the Common Age being an Indian Reserve. As a prominent cattle rancher, Vernon had a personal interest in ensuring that the Common Ages were eliminated. Vernon's brother-in-law, I.W. Powell, employed federally as the Indian superintendent to protect the rights of the Okanagan Band, warned Vernon not to do anything that could upset or alert the band until the issue had gone through. It would not be until many years later that we would learn that the land we continued to use had already been taken from us. Not until 1893, when the government began auctioning off the commonage to local settlers, did we become aware of the negotiations that had gone on without our consent. Ours as reserve, it was uh, it, because it was a section that was uh, the area that was set aside for pasture, pasture and horses. But uh, now they tell us that that meant for everybody, not just for us. Commonage meaning a uh, common ground or a common area. There's a wagon road to go to the commonage. For heavy loads, everybody used the commonage road, as we call it then, rather than the one along the lake through Winfield. I've been asked a hundred different times, and I never told them exactly where the the real native trail that that goes. The Klona. Mm-hmm. It's the railroad track is on it. Yeah, that's the native trail. They used to use buggies through yeah. there. Yeah. The, the railroad put it put its track on there. Yeah. So it came through Vernon and it went down down to Cal Lake and it just followed the beach there where the old trail was. Right to Clona. Wow. Ah, that was the old old native trail. Because wow. when you when before you hit Oyama and that and that point there, down below there. That's the, their halfway spot. Them guys are coming south. That's where they they camp there to rest to rest for a while before they go to Coldstream to, to work at Coldstream. My name is Robert Johnson. Born here in the reserve in 1933, 23rd of August. My dad he went to school in Cambridge, and my two aunts, Catherine Camelka, I think the old chief was his. Her grandfather, her dad was Francis Cal Malcolm. And her mother, I'm not sure just what the mother's name was now, but her father was Francis Cal Malcolm. And my great grandfather, Charlie, Charles Vernon, they came over. They never were married, but they lived together and he had the two daughters, Louisa, Trump, Louisa Kalamaka, and uh, she went by Vernon, I believe his name, and Mary Vernon. A few years after, when the women, I don't know if his wife came over from London or what, but he took off. That was the end of their marriage, and she, Catherine later on got married to Louis Bercy. In the early 1900s, orchards blossomed in the valley, while the bunch grass to feed our cattle began to disappear. We were denied water licenses since we were not landowners. 
We gave thanks for the fish in our lakes and our rivers, which sustained us while our lands were taken over. When they first made contact with the Europeans, they were so willing to work with them and accommodate their interests. You know, they, they, were, they, they had a good economic relationship. When the fur trade era uh, was going on, which was the first era in Aboriginal, non-Aboriginal relations, um, you know, there were, the Aboriginals and non-Aboriginals were on a more or less equal footing. They had a good relationship. Uh, it wasn't until you know there be the real estate market developed that people started getting interest in land and timber and uh, minerals uh, that uh, um, things started going downhill. And when that when that real estate market developed, when people started getting an interest in land uh, and wanting to live here, wanting to uh, develop uh, businesses and so forth here, that uh, you know the conflict with the Aboriginal people started. The cutting off and selling of this land to settlers is really the heart of the Common Age claim. You don't take land that isn't yours, and if you do take land that isn't yours for some extreme reason, such as an expropriation, you compensate the owner. The province's ongoing selling of our lands with Silver Star in the 70s, Penus Lake, and now the Common Age needs to be addressed. The, the cutting off of the Indian Reserve Number Nine to Commonage, really, in the view of the Okanagan Indian Band, the federal government comes across as saying, "We stole the land, but we stole it fairly. We still are the, of the view that it is an Indian reserve." The size of the Commonage Reserve today is about 28,000 acres, just over 42 square miles. The northeast corner starts just north of Kalmalka Lake and goes south to the head of the lake, then follows the shoreline down to Oyama. Taking in part of Oyama and continuing south along the west shore of Wood Lake to the narrowest part, then across or west to meet Okanagan Lake. Then it travels north up the shore of Okanagan Lake to approximately the ball field at Marshall Fields past Paddlewheel Park, then east encompassing Predator Ridge and the Allen Brook Center to meet up at the northeast corner above Kalmalka Lake. These boundaries include lands taken out of reserve by Mohan's erroneous survey in 1881. They had the names for every place, and if I knew the language when they were talking about it, and if they did, the Okanagan language is very descriptive, I would have been able to go exactly to where they t told me just by telling me the, the, what the landscape was like and the names of the men. Mkmapalak, the very end of the lake, head of the lake. Mshistmustin, little jumping over place, Vernon. Mkmapalak, little head of the lake, Kalamalka Lake. Ksunk, island, cars landing. Kukwilkwilskan, many little red rocks, Oyama. A lot of these places got destroyed without having a archaeological digs. Like there was no interest in knowing what's there, eh? and our people probably buried there because our people always considered the land sacred. And that's the reason, because they buried their people were just about where they died, and it was easy digging, eh? So. I imagine the Comnage area too, where they, they our people are probably left along there too. That's still there, maybe. Uh, the elder people, you know, the people from from uh, for the last two hundred years, you know, have always been saying, you know, that there is land there. This land has been taken away from us. You know. And it's, that, it's in that spirit, you know, that, that, that we have got to this stage. In 1989, after extensive research, the Okanagan Band brought forward its specific claim concerning the Common Age Reserve under Canada's specific claims policy. Murray Alexis was chief then. But I would like to see that, you know, that there was some justice and some, uh, some, 
some corrections made for these for this because basically what it's doing it's uh, it's taking away the opportunity of our younger generation of people you know there's a whole generation of people that that are, have not been able to use this property uh, I came in and followed Murray as chief in the early 80s and we actively pursued the claim and following uh, my term as chief, uh, Chief Albert Saddleman also followed and pursued the claim uh, federally. In 2000, 16 years after we filed a specific claim agreement, the Canadian government finally accepted the claim for negotiation. After a meeting between Robert Nault, who was then the Indian Affairs Minister, and the Okanagan Indian Band Chief, Dan Wilson, Minister Nault accepted that claim for negotiation. The province later joined in as a full party to those negotiations. But why did it take our people until 1989 to bring such an important matter to the government's attention? I don't think the average Canadian is uh, aware of some of the injustices that Aboriginal peoples in this country have been subjected to. Uh, you know, at different times, uh, chiefs were appointed by Indian agents. Um, they weren't allowed to vote in federal elections until 1961. They weren't allowed to uh, hire lawyers or raise money for land claims until 1951. Uh, when laws were created to allow for preemption of land, they were specifically excluded from the right to preempt land in their own territories. It was illegal for them to do it, to own land. Once our people gained access to the courts, it took t this was foreign to us, and it took time to become educated in this legal system. Once we found our voice, we had to learn how to work with this system, and in the end, we were hoping that our understanding could be voiced through this legal system. The Commons Reserve was always a reserve, and we felt that we always had rights to this reserve. Once we gained a legal voice, we were optimistic for the first time, the settlement could be achieved. This would resolve this outstanding injustice. There was enough evidence there to proceed to where we're at right now. Our lawyers have assured us that ours is the strongest out of all of the commonages here that were formed here in British Columbia. They looked at who formed it, was it surveyed, when was it surveyed, and uh, when was this reserve formed. It was formed through the Joint Reserve Commission with federal and provincial uh, representatives, and also this commonage was surveyed. Based just on those two, it's, it was actually a natural reserve. So how can you say it wasn't a reserve? It was surveyed and was formed by people. It's strong, and but we are a little, just a little bit reluctant, uh, you know, to say, well, we'll get so far, then the government can pull out. With the upcoming Olympic Games, if this claim and other claims in the province aren't resolved and settled fairly, we will have the attention of the international community, which is the world, um, looking at at Canada and how it treats its Aboriginal people and we will take every advantage of that situation to call on the world community to come to our aid to resolve these outstanding issues. We've been in the federal government process now for nearly 20 years. From a commercial perspective, the Common Age Reserve represents some of the most valuable real estate in all of British Columbia. This is lakefront on both sides with enormous potential today. It is currently used for recreation, an international world-class golf course, Predator Ridge, and for residential and cottage purposes. One of the key challenges from a legal perspective is how do you put a value on such an enormous piece of property? Unfortunately, the case law does give us a lot of guidance. What the case law says is that you look to how the owner would have used it if the owner had been given the opportunity. You look back with the full benefit of hindsight on what the highest and best use for this land would have been over the last 130 years. 
and really how it has been used is a pretty good indication of how the band could have used it and benefited from it. The other part of damages cal calculation is looking at the current value of the land. And a lot of improvements and developments have taken place on this land, like the golf course and houses, but none of that enters into the damages calculation. What the damages calculation does is, say, is says in the specific claims process, let's pretend that none of that was there. Let's pretend that this is a piece of raw land between those two lakes today, and how much is it worth? There has never been any doubt that the Commonwealth Indian Reserve Number 9 was and is still part of our reserve. It has never been ceded or surrendered. The general public should be reassured that we're not going to be looking to displace people from their homes. In the most recent past, the band has settled two claims. One, the McKenna McBride cutoff claim, and more recently, the boundary claim. Those claims were resolved uh, with the federal government. They involved lands where uh, innocent third parties had purchased lands within those land claim areas, and the band has never, ever, through the negotiation or suggestion, ever tried to displace people from those lands that they innocently and rightfully bought from third parties. The benefits from a specific claim, especially a very significant one like this, uh, spread quite quickly throughout the surrounding community. The economies of the Okanagan Band and the local community are closely intertwined, so if uh, significant economic development comes to the Okanagan Band, that's going to be more people and more enterprises in the area buying uh, local goods, uh, bringing tourists into the area, and generally vitalizing or revitalizing the whole economy uh, of the North Okanagan. So the benefits here, uh, well, certainly are primarily to the First Nation, because that's whose claim it is, and that's the injustice that it's meant to address. The benefits to the surrounding community will be felt, and will be felt quite quickly. <laughs> We have lost entire reserves, including IRNI. Some parts of other reserves have been illegally taken by the federal government. We know that our claim is legally sound and that the honor of the crown is at stake. We know our rights. These rights were given to us by the Creator and cannot be simply legislated away. We are not going away, and we cannot end this struggle. This duty we owe to future generations. As we work toward reclaiming what was wrongfully taken, we search for a time of fairness and better understanding. Today we stand resolved to right an injustice which began some 130 years ago, and remains still a stain on our relationship with the Crown. <laughs> We do all of this in respect of those who have gone on before us to keep this issue alive. Mama, quest, mama, quest, quest. 